This video is a photographic record of the Herefordshire General Hospital. The aerial view of the hospital illustrates how it looks today in the autumn of 2001, situated in the east bank of a loop of the River Wye, with the front of the building facing west. The present building opened in 1783 and is due to close in the spring of 2002. Up until 1900, the hospital was called the Hereford General Infirmary. It will have served the people of Herefordshire as the General Hospital for 219 years. The central block was the original building and is relatively unchanged. The ground floor contains mainly offices and restrooms. The porch was added to the original building in the latter half of the 19th century. On the first floor, Oxford Ward was named after the Earl of Oxford, the chief steward of the city who gifted the land. On the second floor, Talbot Ward was named after the Reverend Dr. Thomas Talbot, the rector of Ullandwick, who was the founder of the hospital. The attic is the home of the Grey Lady, the hospital's ghost. The two-story building to the right of the central block as we view it has offices on the ground floor. On the first floor King's Ward it is administered as part of Oxford Ward. The three-storey building is called Riverside Wing and has in addition a basement in front. The ground floor contains the Department of Rheumatology, the first floor contains the Department of Mental Health of the Elderly, the second floor consists mainly of offices. This wing was originally built in two phases, in 1922 and 1933, as a nurses' home and provided 60 single bedrooms. The lodge and the entrance to the avenue, thrown to the front of the hospital, are situated at the corner of Mill Street and Nelson Street. It was built in 1865 as a porter's lodge to give access to the front of the hospital. Continuing down the avenue, we pass an entrance to a small courtyard on the left. Beyond this is an empty building, once used as a day hospital for the elderly. An ambulance parked in front is leaving. Continuing along the avenue, we see the two-story Victoria block, opened in 1888 to commemorate Queen Victoria's Jubilee the previous year. Victoria Ward is on the ground floor, an open veranda was added in 1913 and later enclosed, as we see it today. The first floor is used by nurses for changing. The three-storey building between Victoria Block and the Central Block has on the ground floor a dining room called the Riverside Restaurant. In front of the first floor is Hawkins Ward. In front of the second floor there are single rooms and offices. Once again we see the Central Block. This is the entrance porch of the Riverside Wing, which resolves into a wide-angle view of the side of the building. As we follow the wing towards the river, we see the front garden of the hospital and the River Wye. Turning into the small courtyard beyond the lodge, we see the two-story catering manager's office built in 1824 for 59 pounds as the original Porter's Lodge. The next building contains the kitchens, opened in 1931. The entrance sign points the way to one of the doors of the hospital that leads to reception, various departments and the wards. The white coloured building on the first floor is the side of Hawkins Ward and the building on the right is the back of Victoria Ward. The northeast side of the hospital is limited by Nelson Street. We see the catering manager's office and then the boiler house with its tall chimney. This is the exit road from the courtyard at the back of the hospital with the boiler house and the accident and emergency department on the west side, where ambulances can stop outside 
that department. On the east side is the Dennis Edmonds Pavilion, opened in 1970 and named after the group secretary at that time, providing an orthopedic outpatient department and clinic. The back of the orthopedic department continues along Nelson Street till we reach the main entrance to the back of the hospital used by ambulances, patients and visitors for access to the back courtyard, the accident and emergency department, reception and the rest of the hospital. The main back entrance is overlooked by a porter's cabin and the porter is usually present during the day to answer inquiries and direct traffic. Once through the entrance, there is a road on the left which leads to a small car park. We are now looking at the entrance from inside the courtyard. This view is from the eastern end of the car park, showing the porter's cabin in the distance. The building behind the car park is used for training staff in professional development and handling patient information. The porter is now returning to his cabin. Returning to the courtyard just beyond the main entrance, we can see the audiology unit or hearing aid clinic. The next long cabin provides rooms for doctors who are on duty, and beyond that, a side view of a cedarwood prefabricated ward called Harriet Davis. This is a front view of Harriet Davis Ward, built in 1959 and today accommodates orthopedic patients. This is a general view of the back of the hospital. The ground floor of the three-story building in the center of the picture accommodates the X-ray department and various offices. The first floor houses Hawkins Ward. The second floor contains Talbot II Ward. The ground floor of this block accommodates the accident and emergency department. On the first floor, the day room of Thomas Trahan Ward has a flat roof and a balcony with the main ward behind it. On the second floor, there is an extension of Talbot II Ward. Access to the accident and emergency department by ambulances is by the door with a porch over it, adjacent to the exit road into Nelson Street. This is the front of the Dennis Edmonds Pavilion. Looking beyond Harriet Davis Ward and the accident and emergency department, there is a porch with the physiotherapy department on the left and the main entrance to the back of the hospital on the right. Continuing beyond the porch to an inner courtyard, there is access to the occupational therapy department, the mortuary, and the back of the central block. This plan of the ground floor of the hospital shows the general layout. In this magnified view, note the position of the porch, the chapel, and the theatre. This is the porch of the hospital, seen from inside, with trees visible through the outside door. It has several items of historic interest on one of its walls. Three large notice boards indicate whether the medical staff, senior nursing and administrative staff were in or out of the hospital. It relates to the 1970s and so has no relevance today. This inscription reads, the ground on which this infirmary and lunatic asylum are built and the premises attached to them were given by the Right Honourable the Earl of Oxford in the year 1776.
This inscription reads, This tablet is erected in grateful acknowledgement of the financial help given by the League of Mercy during the period 1926 to 1947, and which amounted to the sum of £5,000. Across from the porch is the Florence Nightingale Chapel, which was dedicated by the Bishop of Hereford in 1932. The inscription above the door reads, This room was planned and converted for its present use as a chapel, under the direction of Annabel Cameron, matron of the hospital from 1924 to 1938, whose inspiration evoked the generosity of many friends for the furnishing thereof and the enrichment of windows with coloured glass. Inside the chapel, we see a harmonium in the corner. Chairs, a lectern, and the right-hand window of coloured glass. In this view, we see the carved wood above the altar. The altar itself, the cross, and the two coloured glass windows. Below the angel in the right-hand window, the following quotation from the Bible. Revelations chapter 22, verse 2. The leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. Below the angel in the left-hand window, the following quotation from the Bible. St. John's Gospel, chapter 5, verse 4. An angel went down at a certain season into the pool and troubled the water. Across the bottom of the left window, a quotation from Malachi, chapter 4, verse 2. The Son of Righteousness shall arise. And across the bottom of the right window, with healing in his wings. To the right of the window, the following is carved in wood. To the glory of God, in memory of Mary Elkins, happy year 1935-1936, the gift of her aunt Lillian Elkins. To the left of the windows, the following is carved. To the glory of God, the gift of Alice Ann Fenton, in loving memory of her husband, William Hugh Fenton, and of her brother, Arthur Wellesley Foster, October 1932. Outside the Twin Theatre, there is a plaque recording the bequest of £4,500 given by Mr. Atwood Matthews, a governor, towards building the theatres in 1924. Within the Twin Theatres, a student is seen sitting in the restroom which opens into the vestibule. On the right are the changing rooms for male and female staff, while on the left are four doors giving access to the lobby, an anaesthetic room, a corridor leading to behind the main theatre, and the recovery room. Above the door to the anaesthetic room, there is a wooden plaque commemorating Mr. Brian Thomas, a pioneering orthopaedic surgeon at the hospital appointed in 1947 who retired in 1975. On the opposite wall in a glass case is an old theatre list with Mr. William Ainsley as the surgeon, dated the 6th of October 1925, showing the range of conditions operated on by a surgeon of these days. It includes tonsillectomy, realignment of forearm bones, repair of a groin hernia, amputation of breast, removal of the lower part of the womb, repair of hair lip, and removal of nasal polyps. This is the anaesthetic room. Patients are wheeled through this door from a vestibule. We can see some of the modern anaesthetic equipment that is available. Once anaesthetized, patients are taken through this door into the theatre. The lobby gives access to the main theatre, the scrubbing up room, and the second theatre with its own anaesthetic room. The scrubbing up room is where all staff participating in the operation will thoroughly clean their hands and forearms before putting on sterile gowns and gloves. This is the main theatre, 
and opposite is the door into the anaesthetic room through which the patient is wheeled. We now see the doors into the lobby and scrubbing up room. A further view shows the theatre from the lobby room door. After the operation, patients are taken to the recovery room until they are fit to return to the wards. Hi, my name's Greg Francis. I'm a charge nurse at um, Hereford General Hospital. I've been in theatres now since, on and off since 1986, which uh, is a lifetime. It feels like a lifetime sometimes. Um, I've worked with uh, quite a lot of surgeons over the years. Um, I remember starting off with Mr. Slee when he first came. Um, and then working with certain anaesthetists, such as when Dr. Brooks was here when I first came. And he used to use such methods as the Schimmelbush mask, which was, was quite interesting to see, he used to uh, demonstrate that for students. Uh, but uh, uh, the general hospital's a super place to work and uh, very friendly. And the location by the river is um, absolutely um, super. Hello, I'm um, Kevin Elliott, staff nurse here at the general hospital. I've been working for the Herbert Hospital for about 10 years. Um, I moved over to work here after my first year at the county and um, I found it a very enjoyable place to work and uh, friendship has been um, paramount here to create a team sort of um, working unit. Um, it's a shame that the hospital's going. I'd rather stay here for another five or ten years to be quite honest. Um, and uh, phew, what else does it say except for that um, it's going to be such a shame that we're going. Note the position of the X-ray department, the kitchens, the Riverside restaurant and Victoria Ward. We see a busy radiographer outside the X-ray department, which is in the main corridor running from the front of the hospital to the reception at the back. This is a view of the entrance to the X-ray department and one of its main rooms showing routine X-ray equipment. The second room shows a head scanner using patients suffering from severe head injuries to assess the underlying damage. In the corridor near the X-ray department is a stone plaque inscribed, Herefordshire General Hospital. This stone was laid by Major G.W. Davey, J.P., October 22, 1929. He was involved in the planning of this block and contributed £5,000 of his own money. This is the corridor outside the kitchens, with a window looking into them. The kitchens were opened in 1931 and are supervised by a catering manager. They provide around 11,000 portions of food per week on a three-week cycle. The kitchens serve the general, the county and eye hospitals in Hereford City and to a varying degree the five community hospitals in the county. The cooks work on an eight-hour shift system, some working from 4 a.m. in the morning. The catering staff is then responsible for distributing the food between 6 a.m. and 7.30 p.m. The sign points to the Riverside Restaurant. This restaurant is available to both the staff and visitors. The Victoria Ward is signposted and approached by this short corridor. On one wall is a bas relief of Colonel Henry Hewitt. He was chairman of the hospital committee intermittently for nine years. An open air ward, the Hewitt Pavilion, was named after him and opened in 1927. Victoria Ward is on the right at the end of the corridor. This is Victoria Ward, which at present looks after orthopaedic patients. Originally, it was a children's ward. Following the death of a child, a ghost story developed, but a lady dressed in grey with a nun's cowl, the grey lady, visited the ward every night. She lived in the attics, where she caused breezes along the corridors and the ringing of bells. This closed balcony is situated in front of Victoria Ward. The nurse is going back into Victoria Ward. The trowel which hangs in a glass case on the wall was used by Mrs. Cam to lay the foundation stone of the ward 
in November 1887. Her husband, a retired honorary surgeon, was chairman of the management committee at the time. I'm Rose Traherne. I've worked in the General Hospital for 15 years, um, and I've thoroughly enjoyed my time here. At the start of um, when I first came here 15 years ago, um, we all had a brilliant time. It wasn't like coming to work. It was more of a social event. Uh, but latterly, I have to say now that since times have changed, unfortunately, um, it's still fun, but it's hard work as well. Note the position of reception, the accident and emergency department, the physiotherapy department, and the Dennis Edmonds Pavilion. The porch leads into the back of the hospital. On the right is one entrance to the accident and emergency department. On the left we see the long corridor going to the front of the hospital. The main reception desk. passageway which leads to the general practitioner emergency department. The chairs are in a waiting area. We see the main corridor of the accident and emergency department, off which is a trolley store. The department is open and staffed day and night. This treatment room is where patients are examined, resuscitated if necessary, and treatment planned. The sister in charge is in her office. A fully equipped theatre is always available. I'm Andrew Borland and I was appointed as actually emergency consultant here on, in January the 15th, 1985 with the promise of a second consultant within six months of my appointment. I joined a very happy team in a very busy hospital uh, Fifteen years later, and they've just appointed the second consultant that I was promised. Uh, and over those fifteen years, a lot of people have left the general hospital, and we are left with the accident emergency unit, orthopedics, and some rehabilitation beds. Gradually, things have been decanted over to the county site, and hopefully, within six months, we will go there too, and we will get back a unified hospital for Hereford. It's been a very enjoyable time in the early days, very stressful recently with a lack of backup on this site, but we can look forward to a, a future with a single site with the accident emergency unit backed up by the specialities. The door leads to the main corridor, which ends in one of the treatment rooms. Most of the work of the physiotherapy department is to restore normal movements in joints and muscles compromised by injury or disease and sometimes following surgery. This is mainly done by training patients in mobilizing exercises. The various types of equipment seen here are for additional support. Pulleys in the wall are used to stretch arms. The wobbly plates seen below the paddle bars are used to exercise ankles. The beds are used to sling up limbs to help in graduating exercises. Past the reception desk there are cubicles which allow a patient a degree of privacy should they have to remove their clothes. Additional types of treatment include ultrasound, laser treatment and shortwave diathermy to relieve severe bruising and swelling. Inside the front porch of the Dennis Edmonds Pavilion we see reception on the left and a plaster room straight ahead. The corridor leads to the orthopedic outpatient department where patients are examined and treatment planned. I'm Mr. Vic Seal, consultant orthopedic surgeon. Uh, I'm the third orthopedic surgeon that's been uh, based at the General Hospital since the inception of the health service in 1948. It's been a privilege to work in uh, one of the oldest hospitals uh, in the United Kingdom, situated in such a beautiful site by the River Wye. In spite of working in an old hospital, uh, we have developed a very strong orthopedic team which has been able to uh, practice orthopedic uh, surgery, the likes of which the uh, people who raised the money and had the idea to build this hospital could never have dreamed of.
It is very sad that after two and a quarter centuries, this old uh, lady of healthcare in uh, Herefordshire is to uh, close uh, as we move to a new hospital. Time moves on. Uh, the nice thing is that the uh, building, uh, at least its frontage, will be maintained uh, for posterity. This is a plan of the first floor. Note the site of King's Ward, Oxford Ward, Hawkins Ward and Traherne Ward. This corridor outside Oxford Ward shows a porter loading a trolley into the lift. Oxford Ward is used as a day ward for orthopaedic patients. Originally the hospital provided facilities mainly for general medicine and general surgery. But these specialties were transferred to the county hospital some years ago. The door on the left leads to a corridor giving access to King's Ward, which is empty. Outside King's Ward there is a plaque to Mr. Thomas Turner, a surgeon appointed in 1864 who served for over 40 years. Hawkins Ward is used to accommodate aged care patients. The ward was built in 1882 for female patients and named after Mr. Francis Hawkins, whose portrait we see. He was chairman of the board of management at the time and donated half the cost. We see Hawkins Ward at a busy time with a doctor, nurses and physiotherapists tending to the patients. Thomas Trahern Ward accommodates aged care patients. This is its large day ward as seen from the corridor. A view from inside the ward looking back towards the corridor gives a better idea about how it was furnished. There is also an occupational therapy unit attached to it. This trial was used by Major George Davy in laying the foundation stone of this block in 1929. The ward was initially known as Davy Ward until the mid-1990s when the name and patients from Trahern Ward at St. Mary's Hospital, Burkhill, were transferred here. This is the main Trahern Ward. The staircase between the first and second floors leading to the Talbot Wards is a continuation from the ground floor. It is situated between Oxford Ward and Hawkins Ward. It is covered by a glass cupola built in the latter half of the 19th century to improve light and ventilation. This plan shows the site of both Talbot 1 Ward, which is empty, and Talbot 2 Ward. Talbot 2 Ward looks after orthopaedic patients and consists of two joined up long corridors giving access to many rooms. This is the first corridor giving access to a nursing station and small wards. This is the link corridor. The second long corridor gives access to small wards in the treatment room. At the end of the corridor, there is a day ward. This is a typical two-bedded ward. My name's Pat Fisher and I've worked on Talbot Ward for quite a number of years and the orthopaedic department for about 21 years now. Um, we are apparently closing next year and we are all really quite sad about it. It's been a beautiful hospital, although it's old and quite decrepit, um, but we have amazing views here which all contributes to the patient's welfare. And I'd like to say that we've all, we've all enjoyed working here and we are very much a quite close-knit community 
Thank you very much. In the attic today, the only activity appears to be the machinery controlling the lift. The front room has a view over the River Y. The attics used to be the home of the hospital ghost, the Grey Lady, but she has not been seen recently. This is a view of the open door from the front room leading into the corridor. We are now in the main corridor it leads towards the room containing the hospital's water tanks. This room appears to be empty, except for the water tanks. We return to view the front of the hospital. trees and garden the river Y, the Victoria Bridge and the Cathedral farewell to the Hereford St General Hospital with its many memories <laughs>